right, so um, hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about uh, lipidic cubic phase LCP crystallization, uh, how to set up LCP, um, as well as uh, screening and optimization for uh, different radiation sources. So let me actually get the mouse pointer here. Okay. So yeah, uh, membrane proteins are uh, difficult to crystallize because they're unstable outside their uh, native uh, membrane. And in the past uh, 20 years or so, um, LCP, lipidic cubic phase, has uh, emerged as a tool um, for membrane protein crystallization. Uh, to some extent, uh, revolutionizing their structure determination, resulting in a lot of structures. Um, LCP spontaneously forms uh, when lipid and aqueous buffer are mixed in the right ratios, the right volume ratios, and provides a, a native-like uh, membrane environment where um, membrane proteins can diffuse in three dimensions and it contains uh, non-intersecting uh, water channels that can accommodate extra or intracellular uh, domains um, of membrane proteins or interacting partners such as um, G protein in the GPCR context or ligands. Um, LCP supports a high nucleation rate leading to high density of small crystals. Um, although if that is not intended, uh, as we will see later, this can also be optimized for uh, obtaining large crystals. Um, and uh, three-dimensional crystal growth, uh, therefore uh, good diffraction. Um, LCP has a toothpaste-like consistency that requires the use of special sample delivery methods, uh, if it should also be used as crystal delivery medium and not just as a growth matrix. So um, one of the most um, maybe misunderstood aspects of um, LCP comes from the fact that we often say we crystallize a protein in LCP. What we actually do is we reconstitute the sample in LCP uh, where that can uh, diffuse around, um, but the nucleation and the crystal growth um, most likely happen in a related phase at the interface of LCP and such a lamellar phase that grows out of the LCP and not in LCP itself. Um, so this lamellar uh, phase um, allows protein uh, to make contacts between layers um, and also changes the curvature of the lipid bilayer, which in LCP would not be permissible to uh, actually let such contacts form. There's a range of host lipids that exist uh, that can uh, make LCP and are compatible with uh, biomolecules. Uh, important parameters of these different lipids are bilayer thickness, uh, which of course should be matched to the native bilayer thickness of the biological system of the um, proteins we study, but also a water channel diameter that decides how big of a non-transmembrane part uh, we can accommodate. Uh, for larger proteins, you might want to use a, a matching lipid with, uh, for example, a larger uh, water uh, channel diameter. And as uh, well, the lipid also decides um, properties like the curvature of the lipid bilayer. Um, the most commonly used lipid is monoline or 9.9 .9 mag. Uh, the statistics is from 2014, but I'm pretty sure it still holds true this ratio. Um, most um, structures to date are solved in uh, monoline or 9.9 .9 mag. So this mag uh, notation, um, this n dot t mag notation tells us how long the neck and the tail are on either side of this double bond. All these mags are um, monounsaturated lipids. And here we see a, a phase diagram or a temperature composition of um, a diagram of monoline, 9.9 uh, .9 mag, with the LCP uh, highlighted as a blue area, PN3M. And there's also other phases which are still, um, or which can still be cubic phases, such as this uh, uh, green highlighted phase here. Also, you could overhydrate your LCP to form such a mixed phase, uh, PN3M um, mixed with water. 
Um, some of these uh, phases you can distinguish uh, visually. For example, this lamellar phase, L uh, phase, is strongly birefringent under cross polarized light. And this overhydrated uh, LCP looks hazy, whereas a proper LCP is clear. Um, to distinguish the different uh, cubic phases, like this uh, IA3D from the PN3M, you would need um, small angle scattering, for example, to tell them apart. But we aim for this blue area, uh, which um, for monoline and it's 20 degrees uh, Celsius is 40% uh, uh, protein volume and 60% lipid volume. It's actually quite a narrow range, um, in particular with respect to the temperature, which can cause a problem if we're just below 20 um, Celsius, it can go into this bistable uh, phase, or you can get a, a lamellar um, a contribution. And this poses some issues for sample handling, especially at XFEL, as we will see later. Um, related, so there's shorter chain MACs, such as 7.9 MAC, that have different temperature properties, uh, which can be useful for uh, sample um, injection at the XFEL. Um, but again, yeah, we will come back to that. Um, so this phase diagram also uh, gives us some tricks or tools how to manipulate the phase of a given sample. For example, if you have overhydrated your sample and it seems hazy, uh, you could either titrate, uh, titrate in some lipids to move maybe from this point, uh, sorry, from, from this point closer to uh, this point, or uh, you could briefly chill it, um, for example, at four degrees for around 10 seconds to move it back into LCP. So this would be equivalent from um, being at this point and then moving uh, down here back into this uh, PN3M. So ideal crystal properties depend on um, the radiation source that we want to use. Conversely, um, we may have the luxury of choosing the radiation source by, um, based on the kind of crystals we obtain. And without uh, going into too much detail on XFEL versus uh, synchrotron, I, I will just say that for synchrotron, we require uh, relatively large crystals, uh, large here meaning 20 to 30 microns or more. And we collect data under uh, cryogenic conditions from a uh, single or a few crystals. Whereas for XFEL, uh, we use small crystals such as those uh, often found as initial uh, hits in crystallization screens. They, they can be one micron or smaller. And we collect data from continuous supply of these crystals um tens of thousands of crystals um, at room temperature uh, without radiation damage um, and no harvesting crystal harvesting in the traditional sense is uh, required um, the uh, general procedure for setup and optimization is as follows so uh, we have concentrated protein um, in case of gpcrs g protein coupled receptors that are uh, my favorite proteins uh, this concentration can be maybe 20 to 50 mix per mil. And this is mixed then with host lipids in a uh, gas tight, uh, coupled gas tight syringe setup. And then a, a robotic system is used to dispense uh, small quantities of uh, LCP on class sandwich plates in a 96 well plate format. And then we overlay it with precipitant to induce uh, crystallization. And this precipitant would uh, first come from a broad initial screen. We use a 48 salt screen from Hampton typically, uh, 48 salts at two concentrations and different pages of that. And later on, when specific uh, salts have been identified to be crystallogenic, a grid screen around these conditions uh, could be done where on optimization plates, uh, two parameters are varied, for example, salt concentration and pack concentration. Um, and these uh, setups are then monitored in a robotic imager or just under a stereo microscope with bright field and polarized light. And then the cycle continues by either modifying protein construct, as we have heard, or uh, crystallization conditions. Um, crystallization space is high dimensional and uh, crystallization depends on sample properties, uh, host lipids, um, and precipitant conditions. Importantly, the geometry of the crystallization container also plays a role, temperature, time, and so on. For example, we uh, want a high protein concentration, but we also don't want to over-concentrate for uh, membrane proteins in particular. High uh, protein concentration comes with high detergent, 
which can ruin our face properties. So we might uh, want to explore additives to the host lipids, such as cholesterol that has already been mentioned that we typically for GPCRs at 10% uh, by volume off to the uh, monoline. Um, and there's a huge range of um, precipitant conditions that we at least need to test systematically to some extent. One of the early examples uh, of successful optimization is this uh, crystallization of large membrane proteins that only crystallize in sponge phase. Here in gray, this, this area, uh, sponge phase is some kind of uh, hyperswollen uh, LCP. So the addition of certain agents such as um, jeffamine or butane diol, uh, but also high detergent concentration can swell the LCP and turn it into a more liquid-like uh, sponge phase, which may or may not be intended. Uh, sponge phase has much larger water channels and makes it possible for larger membrane proteins to move around more, but uh, poses some issues with um, uh, sample harvesting and um, uh, sample delivery and is um, not usually necessary for GPCRs, for example. Here's some um, examples of representative uh, GPCR crystals optimized for different radiation sources. On the left, um, smoothened receptor uh, that plays a role in uh, development and it's also a uh, anti-cancer target. On top, uh, crystals for synchrotron. It's nice uh, butterfly-shaped uh, crystals. And on bottom for XFEL, uh, really small, um, but a high density of them. The issues with these uh, large crystals was that they had a high mosaicity uh, and diffracted poorly, uh, which is actually quite common for um, when trying to optimize uh, for, for large crystals. So the smaller crystals at Exfel in this case gave much better resolution. On the right, there's some um, Exfel crystals for a serotonin or 5-HT receptor, also a GPCR. Um, bright fields, uh, cross-polarized as well as uh, UV and um, second harmonic generation uh, images, uh, UV and uh, sonic can be used to exclude some false positives in these uh, crystallization trials. Um, I'll now show a, a quick demo video on how to make LCP. This is from uh, JOV, uh, Journal of Visual Experiments from our group. Um, let me quickly exit this view here. Sorry. So again, please let me know if you don't properly see the uh, video that I will now play. Um, So first, um, the protein of interest is uh, concentrated in a, a microcentrifuge, uh, again, to the uh, target um, concentration that we want to achieve or that we can achieve. Um, then we melt the lipid. As I said, for GPCRs, we use a mixture of monoline and cholesterol. And this host lipid is actually usually prepared much before the, the experiment. Um, and then we load protein and lipid into separate syringes um, and mix them in a two to three volume to volume ratio, two parts protein to three parts lipid. Um, actually, usually we would load the protein first and see much, how much volume of protein we have after concentration and then adjust the lipid volume accordingly. Um, so the syringes are connected with this uh, coupler uh, and mixed mechanically by moving back and forth until the phase becomes homogeneous and transparent, indicating the formation of LCP. Uh, LCP is transparent and uh, not birefringent in itself. And we can verify under the microscope uh, the transparency and the non birefringence um, as well as we feel the viscosity when we mechanically mix it in this coupled syringe setup. And uh, this transparency and non birefringence are sufficient to indicate LCP formation, so we don't really have to check the um, uh, small angle scattering, for example, to see the LCP uh, parameters. So um, 
I'll now show the second video that deals with the crystal screening and harvesting specifically for synchrotron. Sorry. So after making the LCP, uh, we will set up uh, crystallization trials in this uh, 96 well format um, on such uh, glass plates with a sticky tape uh, spacer, either by manual dispensing or um, with, with a clicker device or automatically using a robot uh, as shown here. What's not shown is that the LCP drops are then overlain by precipitants and we put uh, on top another glass plate to form an airtight sandwich to prevent a uh, sample from drying out. We monitor crystal growth and once we identify nice and large crystals, uh, we can harvest them. Um, the stereo microscope has to have a cross polarizer uh, to analyze um, and, and, and analyzer so that we, that we can keep track of crystals during harvesting. Uh, and then we open up the well uh, where nice crystals are identified using a glass cutter. And um, so we cut out that part of the top cover glass and uh, pull it away with tweezers after we add a little bit of extra precipitant on top to again prevent sample from drying out during harvest. So this is shown here. So he's, he's added the um, precipitant on top and then now he's using tweezers to pull out the uh, top plate. So this um, yeah, uh, procedure requires a bit of dexterity and like a really steady hand. Um, so uh, what will be done now is we will zoom in to the drop and also engage the cross polarizer to better see and keep track of the crystals um, during harvesting. So this is the cross polarizer coming in. Yeah, you see the crystals lighting up and increasing the contrast to the LCP. And then uh, a micro mount is used to scoop up the crystals, each individual crystal with as little excess LCP as possible. Uh, ex extra LCP would give us high background during uh, data collection. And um, the loop size is also matched to the um, uh, size of the crystals. So commonly we use um, loop sizes of 20 or 50 microns so up to 100 for really large crystals. And then they are plunge, freeze, uh, plunge frozen in uh, liquid nitrogen and crystals are stored or shipped to the uh, synchrotron. Uh, right, so much for uh, large crystal harvesting for synchrotron for XFEL. Uh, we need small crystals, but we need larger LCP volumes as we directly inject microcrystals into the uh, LCP beam. So we need to scale up. Um, we need to scale up um, the volumes to tens of microliters. Um, so after Initially identifying these hits in high throughput in the glass sandwich plate format, similar to uh, what has been shown in the previous slides. Now, instead of optimizing them for size and harvesting them for synchrotron, we would optimize so that the condition, crystallization condition, translates into a larger volume. After making LCP in these uh, coupled syringes, we would uh, use additional syringes that contain precipitant and inject LCP into these to grow crystals directly in syringes instead of using uh, class sandwich plates. Um, remember that the geometry of the crystallization container is an important crystallization parameter. So growing them in syringes instead of class sandwich plates um, makes a difference and it might require some additional optimization. Um, Additionally, important here is that a lot of x beam beamlines, uh, the sample delivery chambers operate under vacuum to reduce background during sample collection. When we inject LCP into vacuum, uh, evaporative dehydration might occur that causes the uh, LCP to go into this crystalline lamellar phase, potentially damaging crystals, but also causing a strong powder diffraction. And what we can do to prevent that is to add a shorter chain uh, lipids such as 7.9 MAC 
before injection, as you remember from the phase diagram I showed on one of the earlier slides, 7.9 MAC is more resilient to low temperature, and therefore we can keep our sample in LCP when we inject it into vacuum. So I'll now show the uh, last video, um, the last demonstration video on how to prepare uh, crystals for XFOL data collection. This is from a different uh, video in Joe from 2016. And we will start from making LCP as before, and then it will show how uh, crystallization in um, syringes is set up, how crystals look like in syringes, and finally how 7.9 MAC is added to prevent evaporative uh, dehydration. And uh, this time I'll actually play the sound of the video uh, because it explains quite well uh, what is going on um, in the setup. So yeah, please let me know if you cannot hear the sound properly. Begin this procedure with the reconstitution of membrane proteins in the lipidic cubic phase, or LCP, using syringes number one and number two as described in the text protocol. After a transparent and homogeneous LCP is formed, move the entire sample into syringe number two. Detach syringe number one while keeping the coupler connected to syringe number two. Connect a removable needle to another 100 microliter clean syringe called syringe number three. Aspirate approximately 70 microliters of the precipitant solution into it. Disconnect the needle from syringe number three while keeping the Teflon ferrule inside the syringe. Connect syringes number two and number three through the coupler, making sure that Teflon ferrules are correctly in place in both syringes. Carefully screw the coupler tightly into position. Orient the coupled syringes vertically with syringe number two on the bottom and inject the protein-laden LCP sample from syringe number two into syringe number three slowly and steadily until the LCP string touches the plunger of syringe number three. The injected LCP volume will amount to about one-tenth of the initial precipitant volume in syringe number three. Verify the volume by the scale reading on both syringes. Then, disconnect syringe number two. The coupler now is only connected to syringe number three, which contains the sample immersed in the precipitant solution. Use parafilm to completely seal syringe number three, including the plunger syringe interface, the opening end of the coupler, and the needle nut. Incomplete sealing during this step can cause the precipitant conditions to change and the sample to dehydrate. Repeat the injection of the protein-laden LCP sample steps to set up crystallization in six additional syringes, utilizing a total of approximately 50 microliters of the LCP sample. Store the sealed syringes in a plastic sealable bag with one or two fiber-free cleaning tissues pre-soaked with water to protect against sample dehydration. Seal the bag and store the syringes in a 20 degrees Celsius incubator during crystal growth. For crystal detection, remove the syringes from the incubator to image the LCP samples directly inside the syringes every 12 to 24 hours under a stereo microscope with cross-polarized light. Identify crystals as tightly packed shiny particles or, in the case of smaller crystal size, as a uniform glow from the LCP filament. Return the sealed syringes to the bag and store at 20 degrees Celsius for future use. The lipid titration step is necessary to absorb the excess precipitant solution and to prevent lipid freezing upon injection into the X-ray free electron laser beam. About one hour before the beginning of data collection, remove the syringes with the samples from the 20 degrees Celsius incubator. Select two to four syringes for sample consolidation based on a similar crystal appearance and similarity of crystallization conditions. Carefully remove the parafilm sealing from the selected syringes. Remove the syringe coupler and attach a clean, removable needle to the first selected syringe. Gently and slowly push the plunger forward to squeeze the precipitant out through the needle into a microcentrifuge tube. Exercise caution at this step 
because applying high pressure on the plunger can eject some of the crystalladen LCP along with the precipitant solution, leading to a partial or complete loss of the sample. Stop the plunger when most of the precipitant has been removed and the LCP has accumulated at the needle entrance. Perform this process for the other selected syringes. To consolidate the resultant LCP samples, Connect two syringes together through a clean coupler. Depress the plunger on one syringe to transfer the entire sample from one of the syringes to another. Disconnect the empty syringe. Repeat this step to consolidate all of the crystalladen LCP material into one syringe. Remove as much precipitant as possible. Add approximately 5 microliters of 7.9 mag or the original shorter chain mag host lipid to an empty syringe. Connect this syringe to the syringe with the consolidated sample through a syringe coupler and mix by alternatively depressing the syringe plungers. Repeat the process until all the residual solution is absorbed and a homogeneous and transparent LCP is formed. Move the entire mixed LCP sample into one syringe and disconnect the empty syringe. All right, so um, this is how to prepare the um, sample at the XFL beam uh, line. And then on my last slide, I want to share with you some uh, maybe uh, tics, uh, uh, tips and tricks uh, in particular that have been useful for me in the GPCR context. Uh, but they might also be generally applicable. So um, one thing to always keep in mind is that large crystals often grow at the crystallization boundary. Um, so for optimization in your grid screens, you always want to go from no crystals to gris crystals. So you want to cover um, to, to make sure to sample this uh, crystallization boundary. Um, screening optimization is an iterative process. It's uh, most difficult to find uh, and um, initially identify crystals. After you get your hits, it's often a good idea to rescreen similar conditions using some additive or some condition you have identified. For example, if a certain additive is important to obtain these initial hits, maybe you will identify more crystallization conditions if you go back and use the same additives also for conditions that initially did not give crystals. And then your sample is a uh, moving target. Um, some properties uh, always change when you prepare such a sample and you don't have easy control over things such as detergent content. So especially for XFIL, I always prepare a, um, some kind of mini grid of conditions. For example, uh, three different salt conditions versus two different pack concentrations. And what I often find is that um, sample setup and crystallization can be more sensitive to salt concentration um, than to pack concentration. So I want to cover more salt concentrations. And then finally, yeah, never give up. And also if you obtain crystals that look ugly, they can actually diffract uh, rather well. So um, with that, um, I'm happy to take uh, any questions.